Good to have you back for Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture, which happens to be our 226th show, and it is the first one in 2022. So Happy New Year. And um, Happy New Year. I want to share with you uh, on midday, New Year's Day, I was uh, on the Autobahn in Germany in what we call the Kohlenpot, which is the coal pot, and I had a radio on, and it basically said, well, now everyone had had a happy new year even the last ones in the united states um and their remote pacific islands somewhere and i thought who this is this is all of us so we're back from all these different parts of the world broadcasting live from our traditional triangle back in honolulu hawaii one of these remote pacific islands there in his bishop museum hi de soto how do you do everyone and happy new year as well Good. And we have in the United States on their West Coast in his Long Beach, Ron Lindgren. Hi, Ron. Happy New Year. Hello. A most happy New Year to all the viewers. Good. Let's hope this is a better year, too. Exactly. For many reasons, in many ways. And we have to do a little bit of uh, still a little um, homework to do from when we phased out last year. And that gets us to the first slide because we had some slides prepared to wish everyone Merry Christmas, and then uh, we didn't have them. So here are the promised ones. And so um, we will start to explain. Um, so we see DeSoto here as a going as a Christmas tree with his uh, enlightened beard. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that uh, you said um, you didn't redo this year because of all the masking and stuff like that. It doesn't work that That's well, right. right. That's right. Unfortunately, and, and, no. And you want to describe, um, uh, uh, DeSoto, you want to describe Ron's Christmas gift tree up there? Well, Ron got, a, got to have a picture sent to him of the lobby of the Kahala Hilton Hotel, as it was originally called, with the Christmas tree. And he was very happy that our friend Anne was able to take that picture and send it to him so he could see Ed Killingsworth's first and most perhaps important uh, resort hotel project that he later was working on others, including the Holly Kulani Hotel. And uh, I got to go see the Holly Kulani Hotel last week for the first time since it reopened, and I was very happy to see it. Mm -hmm. Still looking as good as it always did, Ron. Speaking of the floor there that you mentioned, Brian. Yeah. In the lobby, yes. N not a new, new, not a new hardwood floor, but the original one, as you told us, right? Still looking good. Indeed. And Ron, and then you there's wanna, also it, you well, also talk about we, the, <laughs> oh yeah, we were we were also talking about the picture in the lower right, and um, that's a German picture of a Christmas market, which is a tradition in Germany, and. You said, Martin, that you had an amazingly warm Christmas that when this picture was taken, even though it was after Christmas, it was in the 50s. Of course, you don't use the Fahrenheit uh, temperatures there, but it was in the 50s for us in the USA. So it was a very unlikely warm Christmas. And um, we also heard that uh, Illinois had a extremely warm Christmas in the 60s. So that was a peculiar statement from uh, our friend who comes from Illinois, right here at the bottom of the picture below me. <laughs> and uh, right. we've had a lot of calamities this Christmas time. We've had tremendous snows in some places, uh, it's certainly in North America and the U.S. And we've had tremendous rain in California. We had a lot of rain here in Honolulu. Uh, terrible fire unexpectedly in Colorado, very out of character for that time of year. And then COVID is also with us. So those are the icons that we see on the screen with yeah. the, from the top to the bottom. Yeah, and Think Tech Hawaii and Jay keeps uh, panels and presentations about the relationship of COVID and climate change. At, at the bottom right, yeah, that was the 30th of December. So the last time that Christmas market was going on, uh, the ones in Munich, the most famous ones are canceled. But as we were talking in the show before, the one in Rostock where our uh, cross-cultural connoisseurs, Joey and Clara, were recently uh, was opened. And they're back to where 
Joey went to school here in the colon pot and the cold pot in Duisburg, and that's where it is. And here there are, of course, everyone you see on the picture, particularly them still wearing the masks, which you want to say people wear masks when you're in the public. Um, and um, But they're not here. I'm crashing in their place. And where they are, we will see in the next slide. Right. And you were pointing out that even if Germany was exceptionally warm for Christmas, it still isn't really warm, warm. So Joey and Clara had a little side trip to the uh, Canary Islands. And he is in, or in this picture, he's in Las Palmas, which is the capital of the islands as a whole. But there's also an island as part of the Canary Islands. It's called La Palma, singular palm, not multiple palms. And they just had an eruption, a, volcanic or, a volcano eruption, very much like what we went through in 2018 with uh, Kilauea, in which the mountain just erupts out of the ground unexpectedly. And for several months, this tremendous eruption was going on, just as we had. A thousand homes were destroyed. Lava flowed into the ocean, created new land. And they have now, finally, this eruption has ended. But now they've got all this cleanup to do of all the ash as well as they've got to reconstruct all the roads which were cut off by the flowing lava. So that is a very strong similarity to Hawaii Island between La Palma in the Canary Islands and Hawaii Island right here where I am in the Hawaiian Islands. Yeah, they continue to want to be buddies. And the big picture that they provided there is uh, what we like to call Volcrete. So there is uh, this is in the middle of the island. They're very still volcanic. There is little vegetation there, and they continue to build what you would imagine is hospitality typology, which uh, you, Ron, are almost expert in that area. So they're continuing to build stuff there. Uh, but next slide, while I'm still here, I am talking Christmas gifts. Uh, the, the biggest wish of Tropic here, Bundet and Rich, uh, who we know from previous shows, was that I drive up to uh, what's their favorite as far as uh, public transportation. And that is the suspended rail in Wuppertal in Germany here in the Ruhrgebiet. And you found this it's intriguing, right? And the number two, yes, which Michael, thanks for zooming in, is uh, proof of evidence from a show quote from the past, from one that um, um, Tim Schuller did with uh, Rich and Bundet. And they were showing their proposition for installing something like that on Kalakaua Avenue, for example. And why is that so fascinating? Because you guys find it fascinating too, right? Well, I was, you, you told me that this structure that we're looking at in Germany is from the 1880s. So it's a very early technological marvel, really, of the time. It's a steel structure that supports a suspended, like, uh, railway, kind of. And I asked you if this is just a tourist thing or if people actually use it to commute. And you said, no, it still is something that's used for basic transportation for the residents of the area. Now, even though the structure itself is from the 1800s, obviously when you look at the pictures, you can see that the cars are modern. So while it's an old structure, it's got very up-to-date accommodations for carrying people. Mm -hmm. And while it, be, it might be typologically be very, um, you know, inspiring, and again, if you look at our heavy rail that stumbles around like elephants with big legs, this seems more tropical, exotic, spidery, you know, more filigree. But before you get too excited, we should probably take everything with a with a grain of salt. And as far as materiality. Uh, while we always say we caution people about glass and steel on the island because it doesn't grow, neither one grows anywhere there on the island, and nor does the labor that installs it. But here it could be called a traditional vernacular material because this area of Germany is traditionally the, the, uh, the Pittsburgh of, of Germany with a heavy steel industry in the past. And that's where the name Kohlen pot, coal, Kohlen means coal. And pot is where you melt it and you, where you melt the steel is, right? And we go to the next slide because then I also drove one more town over, which is the city of Bokochum, to uh, revisit something that has also chosen steel as the local material. And that looks familiar to us, right? 
Yeah, well, that's the that's the canopy over the entrance to the subway, and that was created by your father. And I don't remember now. Were you involved in that as well, or was that was that the was that the Dispang architectural firm or this your father? This is Dispang Architect because dating this this is uh, ten years old, a decade, and that's when uh, Dispang Architect was was operating. And I like to do, so it's by both of us. Um, and so I like to do post-occupancy evaluation, evidence-based design life cycle assessment to see how the projects are doing over the years and they're aging and hopefully they're aging in grace. Here, they could do some uh, glass power washing here because there's some trees over the canopies and it deposits some leaves there that then basically decompose. And But uh, I'm happy we choose for several reasons the structure because it doesn't really show that much. But we also identified uh, another which we have been, uh, you know, calling a global disease as far as material authenticity, right? What did we see there at the bottom left? Uh, well, you see that the uh, concrete is being painted, and that's something that we do not like because, for example, for one thing, concrete, if you leave it alone, looks just fine. But also because once you paint a surface, you have to keep repainting it. And once you've painted concrete, you're never going to get all the paint off of it because it is a porous surface. So if you take that step it is irrevocable. And particularly in the case of brutalist architecture, I personally find it very offensive when raw concrete gets painted. So we're seeing test patterns of concrete paint and we don't like it. Yeah, and my dear uh, colleague on the client side, Tom, happy new year. First and foremost, you will see my email when you come back from your Christmas holidays that I send you regarding this and advise you to, if so, choose the lightest color that looks most like concrete, even though it might not like that either. But anyways, let's go over this, at least for this point. Let's go to the next slide. And as you already introduced, this is Gunter Despang. This is my father, uh, some uh, almost uh, half a century ago in the same town in Bochum, where he, and I have some early childhood memories about my step-grandfather's uh, who was a coal mine worker, by the way, and he lived what we are rediscovering now, which is self-sufficiency. They lived on their land in such a way that they had all their vegetables and, and basically um, greens and stuff like that and a couple of animals that they could live off their land because they weren't making enough otherwise. And so that was the system. Now we're looking back into that. And so he uh, started out his career talking his uh, relatives into... Uh, developing the land for housing. So he became very early a developer, which uh, usually is a no-go and he later became rather critical about. And my sister is now going in the same direction and my father is more eased on that one. Anyways, it's another story, but this is a project he did then for um, a client. And it's a traditional, as you see at the top right, um, gable roof, that he added on to. And we featured that in the show uh, celebrating his 80th birthday about a year ago. And so I was curious when I got there and I couldn't see that sexy curve. So I had to go through um, the gardens of the neighbors. And then uh, these the, the owners, the current owners were out there in their, in their whirlpool. That tells you how warm it was. And they basically invited me immediately to jump in, which I resisted, but I stayed for the rest of the day and the evening and dinner, and we became new good friends, uh, Sabina and Arndt. Thank you very much for all of that. My father, indeed, when we involved him, basically said, I, I don't think it's senior moments, but I'm not quite remember all the crazy detailing as you see the fireplace and this sort of seating, almost contemplative, uh, meditative alcove in there. But in, in talking to my sister, who talked to him about it, it's there was a very sort of a strong client that probably had a stronger impact than my father even remembers, right? And that basically segues us uh, back to you, Ron, and your story about um, uh, situations of unfortunate circumstances of water damage that made you having to rethink uh, major parts of the interior of your house. And for that next slide, which shows us the condition uh, of when you had just started to recover or get back on your feet, right? But tell us more in detail. Yeah, uh, 
I'm looking so much forward to the year 2022 because 2021 uh, encompassed a severe water damage to the home when a second floor water supply pipe under a bathroom sink uh, burst, mostly just from old age. Um, and I had so much damage to furniture and to the home itself that I had to spend a good portion of the last half of all last year without my familiar uh, setting. My, uh, my home, the furnishings, the books that I, I constantly are looking at, all gone in remote storage. Uh, but I, I'd like to say how lucky I was in that I had the smarts that as soon as I got the water turned off to the house, a half hour later, I had an emergency uh, damage company arrive and immediately get rid of any standing water and to vacuum out any water that's caught up in all of the uh, uh, carpets, which were all ruined. My advice to those who unfortunately might have water damage is don't wait a moment to call those people. Uh, they, they, it used to be sort of a cottage industry. Now it's definitely developed into a very sophisticated operation to get your own home or your own business or whatever building might be damaged, both by water or fire. And uh, these, these same people that do the cleanup, do the drying out, they, uh, they take things away and store them in remote storage. They, they also arrange the tests you might need, like asbestos tests and uh, mold testing, because you can't really live in your home healthfully until all that mold is gone. Uh, and then they'll suggest a general contractor for you to work with. Go with their idea because these people, the cleanup crew, the damage crew, the general contractors have worked together on many, many projects. They've also worked together on many, many projects also with your home insurance company. Uh, and finally, the construction is done. I chose to, to live at my home in the one room that wasn't severely damaged because as a retired architect, I wanted to keep an eye on the demolition and the construction to see that it really went my way. And it's good that I did because the, the, the workers for the contractor every day have questions. Your insurance policy will allow you to live in a hotel, although they won't provide food for the whole time that your house might be unlivable or a kitchen isn't available or bathroom facilities aren't available. But I chose to sleep in a sleeping bag and do so. And at the end of about three and a half months, the uh, process was completed. And uh, my biggest loss, as we'll see in, in the next slide soon, was a, uh, a very large Italian storage cabinet that I bought when I was very young and was first making money. And uh, it was about 10 feet wide, seven feet high and contained a lot of my Buddhist and Hindu sculptural objects that I picked up let's on. Bring, let's years. bring the slide up already, uh, Michael, please. Next slide. So here it is, yeah. what you're talking about. It's sort of a, a brooding black presence in the living room, but the fact was uh, the, all the sliding doors were covered with a very shiny black lacquer. So it was like a mirror surface. But right in the middle of it all, as you can see in the picture uh, right in the, in the center, was a lighted alcove where I displayed some of my favorite books and some of those sculptures I was talking about. So uh, something that was 40 years old and very expensive was not gonna be replaced. So I, I worked with my contractor who also talked to my insurance company for me and decided to build a, um, a display alcove of my own, which was the, the slide before. If we go to the next slide, please. That alcove, uh, which was lit from above, I decided to use some uh, self-stick wallpaper, which was a gold leaf that displayed Japanese Edo style autumn flowers and spring flowers. And at the same time, I still wanted to display my, uh, my beloved sculptures from all my business trips. And so I had some glass shelves installed on the sides of that alcove. Next slide, please. Here's the alcove. Uh, DeSoto reminded me that this was a bit like the Japanese 
architectural use of the tokenoma at alcove uh, designed to display uh, some art and uh, mostly just to contemplate for. Uh, and here you see the entire wall with the uh, spring flowers on the, on the left, the autumn flowers on the right. Next slide, please. Uh, at the same time, my insurance company bought me a very nice walnut credenza, which I picked up from design within, uh, within reach. And I was beginning to think in these photographs uh, of what I might display on it. And I had a Thai tea uh, spirit house. I also had a sculpture that actually would sit on the top of the credenza, which is a replica of a very famous 14th century bodhisattva, uh, which is actually in the Honolulu Fine Arts Academy, uh, which is on wonderful display. It's a full-size human figure in wood of a bodhisattva. Next slide, please. This is, uh, again, just a, a, a view of that particular bodhisattva now lording it over that alcove. And uh, Martin, you had some thoughts on the slides to the right. Yeah, uh, bottom right is a show quote uh, from your boss and friend, business partner at Killingsworth's home which you told us that different than people might think, it was not furnished um, uh, exactly proportional to the very lean and crisp and very high modern uh, way the architecture was, but that, that Ed basically allowed himself and afforded casuality and comfort over style and and objects as as you know sometimes are more fetish than uh than fulfilling the the purpose of 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 holiness if if you want to say so so to to this regard it just reminded me of of this and then um on the top right um is basically one of my favorite of you guys projects that unfortunately stayed unbuilt which is that very affordable housing for Latin American uh, working class people, these courtyards, which uh, one would assume to, very, to be very, very minimally furnished, um, uh, if, if, if at all. So again, in, in this regard, we're not talking about a high end, um, you know, super richy, expensive, but you were telling me, uh, Ron and us, that uh, the people now that you know who bought Ed's house recently are now putting in furniture that actually um, looks way more like one would have expected that Ron's was, uh, excuse me, Ed's was furnished, but actually never was, right? Is that all fair to say? Yes, they've, uh, they've sort of foregone comfort, which is something that some mid-century furniture doesn't provide. Uh, <laughs> For looks, it certainly looks more applicable to the mid the, the, the mid century architecture they had designed. Uh, and there are some classic new pieces, and there are some rather quirky pieces. In my own home, I've got some quirky pieces too that we'll look at in the next slide, I believe. But before we do, you have talking about uh, the appreciation of your guys' work and um, the houses selling and being recognized and registered. You have some very uh, hot of the press updates about the one of the triad houses, right? Yeah, today I found uh, that one of the houses, uh, which has been put on uh, the list of national historic places, is now, once the owners uh, uh, leave the home, is going to be uh, donated to the La Jolla uh, Historical Society. So in other words, uh, and along with some maintenance funds, I hope. So in other words, that building will consider, will be going on from its 1959 beginnings, hopefully for decades more. Absolutely. And wish, wishful thinking, I immerse myself today in my virtual background in your living room that you just, you know, made us... Uh, be very curious about how it all looks when it all comes together. And that's the next slide. Yeah, I must say that the, uh, that slide looks better without you in it, Martin. Uh, <laughs> what, what, I, what I was going to say is that uh, 
I've I've got some very quirky furniture too. Over almost 37 years of living there, for example, the coffee table is an example of postmodernism. One of Tori Satsas's coffee tables, and yet there there's also furniture by the the master architect Corbusier. Uh, there's a, a long, comfortable black leather sofa, and beyond it, you can see what I finally uh, realized by furnishing my tokonoma with that credenza, with sculpture, and on either side, I developed some shelving so I could put a vertical row of books on each side. And so now I'm living quite happily in a situation that's even better than what was there before. It's that whole old adage about once you're given a lemon, make lemonade. <laughs> the old black uh, Italian storage system, as much as I had come to love it, and how familiar I was with it uh, is gone. And as a result, the room is much larger. It seems much larger. It actually is much larger. And it's much brighter and a happier place for me to ruminate. <laughs> well, talking about good, good wishes and, and, you know, promises for the new year, that would be one to say, make a virtue out of a dilemma, right? And why you would call this sort of probably eclectic, the kind of the combination of the furniture in there, like the Satsas table and then the candle ring, Achille Castiglioni light fixture there. It also reminds me of your recommendation for your projects, your hospitality projects, where you basically say um, one should basically, rather than, and let's get to the next slide, which is, has to be our last one for today, as you were recommending as to do a total haul over and saying everything is new, you should start to add furniture, even as, as a hotel to say, okay, over time, I found these two new pieces and add them to it. And then it grows organically rather than looking sterile, like from a catalog, right? Every so many as our exotic escapism expert, Suzanne reminds us every seven to 10 years, throw everything out. No, do, don't do that. Evolve it and grow it. And then it gets character, right? And talking about characters, we're running out of time. We have one minute left, but please introduce to us uh, who were one of the first people visiting your, uh, your, your new old home again, one of your best friends and a little bit who they are and what we should uh, know, especially um, him for. Yeah. Uh... To the right, there's my goofy grin showing that I'm really satisfied with what I've uh, produced in the home uh, in ter terms of renovation. The couple shown to the left are Scott and Marcia Fitzgerald, good friends, former employees at Killingsworth, fine architect. Uh, and what he's done for us, he's a great friend of the show. He uh, uses his Photoshop skills that I take advantage of. And for example, makes views out of windows disappear to make a point about, for example, the Holly County guest room. And when I was making presentations on the Killingsworth life to many organizations and Doko Momo, uh, we would sit together and even improve the photographs of Julia Shulman, the, the, uh, arguably the finest architectural photographer of the last century. He would simply make uh, telephone poles and those ugly swagging electric lines disappear from these iconic photographs and made them much more interesting and valuable. And show quoting at the very top left, remembering he can even make volcanoes disappear. <laughs> <laughs> because Diamond Head is actually out there, but you don't see it. It looks like there's no Diamond Head in the view from the Holly Kulani. And we did that to make a point that the room looks so generic, it could be anywhere rather than in Waikiki. Exactly. If you want to know more about that, you got to go back and watch the shows from the end of last year, because now we're at the end of another exciting little bit more than 28 minutes. Uh, there's more to come, Ron, because that wasn't the last disaster that happened to you that you try to find, again, a virtue out of the dilemma. So we're going to continue with that next. And until then, have uh, a happy and a good and a dry, stay dry and happy. <laughs> uh, importantly, uh, I hear from Michael, there's another wet front coming uh, to you, DeSoto. 
on the island. So yep. we all stay dry inside out. And uh, again, happy new and much better 2022. And see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. All right.